I deactivated that automatic recording, so now I forgot it. Um, all right, let's restart. <laughs> First, welcome everybody to our last STEAM age seminar this semester. Um, I assure you, this would definitely not be the least. Uh, it will be very interesting talk. I look forward to it. Um, and if you missed any of our previous uh, talks, you can find uh, the recording for some of the seminars on YouTube channel. And uh, this talk will also be made available on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and search for Steam H seminar series, so you will find all the recordings uh, over there for this semester. Um, even though not all seminars uh, were recorded and shared on YouTube, but we do have quite a few over there. So now it's um, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, Dr. Ignacio Moore is the full professor of biology at Virginia Tech. And he's the organism biologist interested in animal behavior and physiology. He got his bachelor degree in biochemistry uh, at the University of Arizona. And his doctoral degree in zoology from Oregon State University. And he did his postdoc in biology and psychology at the University of Washington. So since 2004, he has been a faculty member in the biological science department at the Virginia Tech. And, but he's also affiliated with the Global Change Center, which is a big uh, center, as I uh, learned recently. Uh, and he's also affiliated with the Freeling Life Science Institute. And his research is for focused on understanding how animals function in the unique physiological and social environment. And it involved, uh, his work involves uh, field work from the Arctic to the tropic, really, across the globe. So at Virginia Tech, he teaches courses on animal physiology, uh, behavior endocrinology, as well as study abroad courses in Ecuador, and most recently, the body of sex, uh, which is the basis for the talk today. So uh, this course uh, he taught at uh, Virginia Tech, the body of sex was conceived as a science course for nine science majors. Uh, and it's an effort to educate students on the biological basis of uh, sex differences in humans. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, Dr. Uh, Moore actually single-handedly organized all the STEAM H seminar we had here last semester. And uh, he's really interested in collaborating with uh, Virginia State University to, in both education and the research. And for that, I really appreciate. Um, and I know some of you students in the audience um, might have, well, uh, benefited from such collaboration and a congratulations for your success. And, uh, Again, hopefully we'll have um, more collaboration uh, like this, and um, again, in both education and research in the future. But now without further ado, let me give the room to Dr. Moore, who will give a uh, his talk on the body of sex. And you can join me in welcoming Dr. Moore to our seminar series. Thank you. I'm here to you, sir. Thank you. So, Thank you for that really nice introduction. Let me start sharing my screen here. Do you guys see that? You see yeah. the one screen? Yes, I can see the slider with the title. Okay. Whoops, hang on. Okay, let me make my little laser pointer thing work. I like the blue one today. Okay. So today I want to talk to you then about the biological basis of sex. And so I, um, as mentioned, as I started this, this lecture comes from a course I teach, and it basically started because of the lack of scientific understanding um, of what it mean, what sex means and what is, for instance, what is sex versus gender? Um, how do we actually make a boy or a girl? And a lot of this comes from the basic question of that we actually are going to see later on this summer, hopefully, and that who gets to compete as a female. In this case, you know, the summer will be in the Olympics. Um, now we're actually seeing all of these points um, 
you know, coming up in a lot of talks within our society and even down to even to high school sports. Um, so these, this talk, I think, is very relevant to where we are at as a society. Um, I will say that if you have questions, I can't monitor the chat, but if someone wants to, if you want to just speak up, if you have a question as we go, um, feel free to interrupt me um, or someone can mention, uh, forward me the question through the chat. Okay, so let's, let's start with sex versus gender. Okay, the word sex. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want yeah. to clarify the chat is disabled. So people will have to speak up if they have a question. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so the words sex and gender are commonly used interchangeably. Okay. We see this all the time. It's frustrating for me. Um, and I don't know why this has occurred. I think some of this is people don't like to use the word sex. They think of sex as a verb rather than, um, rather than uh, a noun. Um, but they are different. Okay. Sex refers to the biological and physiological characteristics, okay, of an organism. Gender is a social construct. Thus, it refers to things like behaviors, roles, expectations, and activities in society. And I'll talk more about some of those differences later on. But the point is that gender roles, for example, change a lot across different cultures and different societies, okay? Sex differences should not change. Okay, so the differences again in the sex is not vary throughout the world, but differences in gender do. Okay, so sex equals male or female, male, well, such a male and female, we'll talk about some variations there within, within that as well. Okay, gender would be things more like being more masculine or feminine. Okay, so in essence, you can think of sex as referring to biological differences. And we'll talk, I'm gonna talk a lot about these, this next few points, right? Chromosome differences, hormonal differences, internal and external sex organs, and what they mean. Okay, then gender describes characteristics that a society or culture delineates as either masculine or feminine. And we, again, we see this all the time now, these things being, um, uh, misrepresented. So I'll give you this example. This was recently put up in front of one of uh, the House of Representatives members um, offices where it says, as you can see, there are two genders, male and female, trust the science. Okay. First of all, there are not just two genders and gender and what they're, they're misconstruing here is gender and sex. And so they are not um, listening to the science. Okay, so I'm going to go through and throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about definitions, okay, because I think some of these definitions, and these are definitions that I view um, from a biologic, from the biological and the scientific perspective. Okay, so legal sex would be the official designation of sex, which is heavily influenced by morphological sex at birth, but can also be influenced by chromosomal sex and gonadal sex. And so this is, for instance, um, what, you know, a appears on your birth certificate. Okay, that's predominantly morphological sex. What the doctor puts on the, on the birth certificate depends on what the, the newborn presents as. Okay, so basically they're looking for usually a penis or a vagina. If it's unclear at birth, traditionally they're modified, surgically modified and assigned as a female, okay? And this actually appears to be the case for a lot of people when they report later on in life that they don't, um, they don't feel like they match what they see on their birth certificate. Often, and this is historically, they would go back and find the medical records and find that they were somehow ambiguous um, at birth and they had been modified um, to be female, to have female genitalia. Okay, sexual identity then is a psychological self-perception of being either male or female. Then again, I want to go back to this gender role, the collection of behaviors and attitudes that are considered appropriate or normal within a specific culture for each sex. I want to emphasize this between a that, you know, within a specific culture. Okay, the other thing to remember when we talk about this, these definitions is the difference between orientation and identification, okay? Sexual orientation would be an erotic sexual attraction for members, other members of the same species, 
okay? And so sometimes it's less of a problem now when we talk about identity versus orientation, but historically there was um, a lot of confusion um, between those two, those two things. So homosexual be attraction towards members of the same sex, heterosexual be attraction, attraction towards members of the opposite sex. And then we have other um, less common forms like bisexuality, which is attraction towards members of, the, of either sex. And finally, asexual. And these are individuals that are not attracted towards members um, of either sex. Okay, and again, identity versus orientation. So identity is asking, what do you identify as? Do you identify, for example, as male or female or other? Okay, and then orientation is who are you attracted towards? Are you attracted towards males, females, both, either, neither? Okay, these are differences. Okay, so this is the fundamental difference between identity and orientation. I think it's really important for people, again, it's not as big a deal now, but historically there was a lot of confusion um, or a lot of people conflating these two things. Okay, so let's now talk about what makes a boy slash girl or how is sex determined? And it really comes down to this figure right here. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this figure. And we're gonna go through each one of these steps in turn. Okay, so we start with chromosomal sex. Okay, and this is the sex that's determined when um, gametes are united during fertilization. The chromosomal sex will determine the gonadal sex, so what gonads develop. Subsequent to that, what gonads develop determines the hormonal sex of the individual, so what hormones um, are circulating in their blood. And that, in turn, will determine the morphological sex. This is what the person presents as, okay? So this is what, when your doctor, well, your doctor, when, when a doctor um, looks, at, looks at a baby and assigns them a sex and the birth, um, at birth, they're using predominantly morphological sex. And finally, this um, determines behavioral sex. So let's first talk about chromosomal sex. So chromosomal sex is sex of an individual is determined by the sex chromosomes that an individual rece receives fertilization. So typically we think of this as males being XY and females being XX. Okay, so how does this occur? And if you've taken freshman biology, you probably are actually high school biology for that matter, you probably remember this, right? Males are typically XY, females are typically XX. These would be the parents, okay? So when a um, female produces eggs, each egg has an X chromosome. When a male produces sperm, it can either have an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. So the offspring then, the female is always contributing an X chromosome. The male you could think of as determining the sex of the offspring chromosomally because he's either contributing this X chromosome through a sperm or a Y chromosome. If he contributes the Y chromosome, then the offspring is going to be XY and chromosomally male. If he contributes the X chromosome, the offspring will be chromosomally female or XX. This is not the case for all animals, interestingly enough. So for instance, in birds, as illustrated by these pigeons, the males are the homogametic sex, okay? They're the ones that are, they're called ZZ. The females are ZW. So in this case, it's interesting. The female is what determines the chromosomal sex of the offspring, because she's the one that either contributes the Z chromosome or the W chromosome. I also wanna go back and mention, well, actually I'll talk about that later. So what is on, let's go back here. What is on this Y chromosome? Usually the way we think of it chromosomally is because there's there are um, cases of people being, for instance, um, XXY or um, XYY or XXXY. Um, usually we, we think of this Y chromosome as setting the pattern for male development. What is it then? 
sorry, that Y chromosome. What is it about the Y chromosome? What is on that chromosome? Okay, first of all, it's much smaller than the X chromosome. Um, while the X chromosome has remained large throughout evolution, um, something on the order of 2000 genes, the Y chromosome has lost most of its genetic material, okay? It's thought to have fewer than a hundred of the original genes. So it has a, a lot less genetic material there. So what's on, what is on it though? Okay. Um, if, if you don't have the X chromosome, the individual develops as a female because we think of the female as the default pathway. There's actually some evidence now that this isn't true that there are active, um, there's a paper that came out in Science, I think it was last year, year before, suggesting that there is an active role for the X chromosome. But in general, we think of the Y chromosome, either you have it or you don't. And if you don't have it, you develop as a female because it's the default pathway. Yeah, that's what I said here. Recent evidence suggests they're active components as well. Okay, the Y chromosome encodes an important gene that determines the male phenotype. Okay, what is that? It's something called the sex determining region of the Y chromosome, otherwise known as the SRY gene. Okay, so it's actually, it's, I like these kind of genes when they give it a gene that sort of makes sense, right? Sex determining region of the Y, SRY. And it encodes for something called testis determining factor. Okay, what is text, testis determining factor? It directs the embryonic gonad. So when the gonad first develops, and I'll show you a slide later on with this, it's um, by potential. It can go either direction, develop into a testis or an ovaris, ovary. Um, this testis determining factor directs the embryonic gonads to develop into testes and begin secreting a hormone, well, two hormones, one testosterone that we know about, you've probably heard about before, um, and the other one is something called Mullerian inhibiting substance, okay? So this SRY gene is encoded for something called testis determining factor, it's starting us down that path. Okay, so what is the Mullerian inhibiting substance? It suppresses the formation of the female ductal structures, things like the uterus, the fallopian tubes, et cetera, by causing regression of the Mullerian duct. So what you've done now is that Y chromosome is turning off development of the female reproductive structures. Testosterone is promoting the formation of the male ductal structures, things like the vas deferens, okay? And other sex glands like the prostate, okay? So now what you've done on that Y chromosome, this SRY gene is turning on male development at the same time turning off female development. Okay, here's where it gets more complicated or exceptions to the rule. If an individual does not have an active SRY gene, so for instance, if there's a mutation, um, that individual, it could be, I mean, I put uh, this in any mammal, okay, will develop into a female, even though it's genetically male. I shouldn't say genetically, it should say chromosomal, chromosomally male, okay? So why is this an issue? Uh, well, I should say this occurs because the, um, the default pathway is female. Now, when does this become an issue? Well, I said that originally um, in your birth certificate, they determine your sex by, uh, by sorry, morphology. If it's unclear, one thing they can do is look chromosomally and see if you have a Y chromosome. Well, you could have a Y chromosome and have a mutation such as that SRY gene is not um, encoding for the testis determining factor, Mullerian inhibiting substance, et, et cetera. And so even though you have a Y chromosome, you may not develop, you develop as a female because that's the default pathway. Okay, so I'm just talking a lot here about exceptions to the patterns. Okay, let's go back to our, um, our stepwise uh, development, uh, sex determination. What comes next, this gonadal sex? Okay, gonadal sex is a sex of an individual is determined by the possession of either ovaries or testes. So this is another way that they can test or determine 
sacs is they do, um, you can either do it surgically or do, um, do other visual, visualization methods to look and see, does an individual have um, testes or ovaries? Okay, this slide here shows what I was talking about earlier. Here is the, the gonad developing. This is this first part here, A, is early on in development. You have a primordial gonad that is not differentiated into a testis or an ovary. And then what you also have here <coughs> are two sets of pipes. You have the Mullerian ducts shown here and the Wolfian ducts shown here. Okay, so you have basically the plumbing for being either a male or a female. If you develop this way to be a female, you do not express the Mullerian inhibiting substance. Okay, and as a consequence, the, um, sorry, yeah, I'm confusing myself here. The gonad develops as an ovary and the Mullerian ducts develop while the Wolfian ducts, they're shown here sort of in these dotted lines, the Wolfian ducts have regressed, okay? The male pattern is the Mullerian ducts regress shown here with these dotted lines here but the Wolfian ducts develop into, as shown here, the vas deferens, okay? So the point here is that early on, you've got both sets, you have primordial gonads undifferentiated, and you have both sets of pipes. If you go towards the male, the Wolfian ducts develop. If you go towards the female, the Mullerian ducts develop, and the other set regress. Okay, this slide just shows what I've talked about up until this point, okay? Here's the step, step of fertilization where you have an X, and in the case of a, a male, you have a X from the mother and a Y from the father. In the case of the female, you have XX, you've formed the zygote. Here's that SRY gene. If you have that SRY gene, you develop the testis, and in this case, you have Mullerian inhibiting substance. So the Mullerian ducts regress because this testis is making testosterone. The Wolfian ducts develop into the male reproductive structures. Over here, because you do not have a Y chromosome, you do not have the SRY gene. As such, the gonad develops into an ovary. You're not producing testosterone. So the Wolfian ducts regress. And because you do not have Mullerian inhibiting substance, the Mullerian ducts develop into the female reproductive structures. And I want to emphasize once again that this is determined by this presence of this SRY gene. So it's not the whole Y chromosome, it's that, S, that sex determining region of the Y chromosome. What is the gametic sex? This is the sex of an individual is determined by the production of ova by the females and sperm by males. And talking to evolutionary biologists, this is actually the most fundamental part of sex, um, sex differences. And this is because of anisogamy. Okay, this is the form of sexual reproduction that involves a union or fusion of two gametes, which differ in size and or for, form. So in this case, in most animals, right, certainly the males that we think of, the ova, the eggs that are produced by the females are, um, more are larger and more energetically costly to produce than is the sperm by the males, okay? There are exceptions to this. There's things like the giant sperm in Drosophila and some species of Drosophila where they make these you know, huge, basically, sperm, really, really long tails. But in general, we think of the eggs as being a bigger investment um, than, than the sperm. And certainly this is the case um, in humans. Okay, now that we've made the gonadal sex and it's making those gametes or can make those gametes, what about the hormonal sex? What's going on with the hormonal sex? Okay. This is the sex of an individual is determined by the concentration of androgens and estrogens circulating in their blood. 
Okay, I want to start by saying when I say androgens, the most common androgens in humans, at least, is testosterone. Okay, androgens are a group, there's other androgens as well, it's a group of hormones, but I, for this talk, and usually I use the two terms um, interchangeably. Estrogens are another, there is no actual hormone called estrogen. There's estradiol 17 beta is the most common one um, in humans. But again, I'll just use the term estrogen or estradiol interchangeably. Anyways, males tend to have higher androgen concentrations while females tend to have higher estrogen concentrations. Okay, but it's not quite that simple, right? And this is going to be, I'm going to talk about this later when we talk about the Olympics and who gets to compete. Okay. Here is the basics, very basics of gonadal synthesis of steroids. You start with cholesterol. Cholesterol is converted to something called androstenedione. Okay. Androstenedione is a weak androgen. It's converted to testosterone, which can be secreted by the testes. But that testosterone can also be act, um, acted upon by an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase converts testosterone to estradiol, and this is what is secreted by the ovaries. Okay, I want you to point, to point out now that when people say, for instance, males or females don't make testosterone, that's false, okay? To get to estradiol, you have to go through androgens, right? Estradiol, uh, estradiol is made from testosterone by this enzyme called aromatase. Okay, and I also wanna point out that this is where it gets more complicated because this is a very generic view of the endocrine system. So the endocrine system, you have things like endocrine cells. Um, you have lots of hormones in your body. You can think of these as cells, for instance, in your testis or your ovaries making steroids. These things are dumped into the blood and then they go to the target cells elsewhere in the body. And as you know, one of the most, the, to have their, for a hormone to have its action elsewhere in the body, it has to bind a receptor, okay? In this case, this is actually, it's a generic hormone. Um, they're showing the receptors on the cell wall for steroids that are actually um, intracellular. But the point here is that a hormone to have its action, it has to work through a receptor. We think of this as like a lock and key mechanism. So if an individual has a mutation such that the testes do not secrete testosterone or the androgen receptor is non-functional, the internal structures and gonads will develop into male structures, but the external genitalia will be female. Okay, what this is, this is called androgen insensitivity syndrome, okay? And this is a case of complete, and this is a picture of people with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. These are people that identify as female, okay? They are genetically, chromosomally, they are XY, but the indivi these individuals completely lack androgen receptors, okay? They are genetically male, Gonadally, they are male, they produce their testes, the testes are internal, okay? But they do not produce, they're not expressing receptors for that hormone. So as a consequence, they develop and present as female, because again, that's essentially the default pathway. There's also partial masculinization that happens through, um, through congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Okay, so it turns out your adrenal glands also produce hormones, produce androgens. It produces lots of hormones, including aldosterone and cortisol. If you have a mutation where you don't produce this enzyme, 21-hydroxylase, if you don't have 21-hydroxylase, then you don't tend to produce aldosterone or cortisol, or if the hydroxylase isn't, um, Aren't, at the levels aren't being produced sufficiently. That means that you go off in this pathway, okay? Because you're producing an excess of progesterone and excess of 17-hydroxyprogesterone, it shunts this way and your adrenal glands tend to produce androgens. And so these are individuals 
that tend to have very high levels of androgens. And these, these could be genetically and gonadally female, but they are producing high levels of androgens because this normal pathway, more typical pathway is not occurring, okay? So these are people that are um, genetically female, gonadally female, but hormonally they tend, to, they tend to have higher levels of androgens, more typical of males. Let's now talk about morphological sex because that's the next step here in this, in this chain. Okay, this is the sex of an individual as determined by their body form. Okay, primary sexual characteristics are those that are present, present at birth. Okay, so this is again what the, what the doctor is looking for when, when they assign um, sex on the birth certificate. Typically, you're looking for a penis in male, a vagina in females. You also have secondary sexual characteristics. These tend to present um, at puberty. Okay, so these can include things like facial hair in males, deepening of the voice, um, pubic hair, females, breast enlargement, and pubic hair as well. Okay, let me go back now and talk more about hormones because to make the, the morphology of a male takes those hormones. I showed you this pattern, the right side of this figure before, right? Cholesterol converted to androstenedione to testosterone going this way. Okay, to, through aromatase to estradiol. There's also the left side of this. And this is where testosterone is acted on by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. 5-alpha reductase changes testosterone to something called dihydrotestosterone or DHT. DHT is a super potent androgen. It's a more potent androgen than testosterone, okay? But here's where it becomes super interesting. To make a boy, right, that uh, typical male development, you have to have DHT because this is what's necessary for male primary and secondary sexual characteristics. So things like development of the penis, um, facial hair, deepening of the voice, et cetera. Okay, estradiol through this pathway is what's necessary for male brain development. So to have a male typical brain requires estradiol acting through the estrogen receptor. Okay, so you have to have both these patterns to have typical male development through estradiol for the brain and behavior through DHT for primary and subsequently secondary sexual characteristics. The last step here is behavioral sex. Okay, behavioral sex is sex of an individual is determined on the basis of male typical and female typical behaviors. And as I said, this is heavily culturally influenced. So what you should be saying to yourself right now, hopefully, is that sounds like gender, and it is. Essentially, um, what we're talking about there is gender, the behavioral sex, because that's influenced by culture. But I wanna add one more thing. So behavioral sex, you could actually replace this with gender. Um, in, some, in some search, can, I'll give you some examples where it doesn't work yet, though. The other thing, though, is this dotted line here right? And this is shown that there's a chromosomal effect um, on behavioral sex. It's independent of this action through gonadal sex and hormones and morphology. Okay, so it turns out that behavioral sex is determined both by genes and hormones. Okay, so it's not just the hormones that determine your behavioral sex. It's also not just the genes. It's a combination of both. And one of the coolest studies that showed this was done on this bird, okay? This is a zebra finch. And if you've ever studied or seen a zebra finch, they're a common model system used in, in a lot of um, sex differences and uh, in neurobiology and, and other types of neurobiology as well, as well as behavioral ecology and other things. 
Males have this orange cheek patch and uh, stripes like zebra stripes on their breast. Females do not have that and do not have the breast stripes and they don't have that orange patch. This individual is genetically half male, half female, right down the middle, okay? This side of the, of the bird is female genetically, this side is male. But the interesting thing is because this animal has one set of, uh, well, one hormonal environment for both sides, right? Any influence of the hormones um, versus the genetics are, um, are be, you can differentiate them. And so this bird, they actually sacrificed this bird and looked at its, uh, looked at its brain. Here's the W chromosome and here's the Z chromosome. So what you can see is that they are, um, they're asymmetric genetically, but they have the same hormonal environment. The brain was also asymmetric, okay? But because it had the constant hormonal environment from both sides, right? Because it only had one circulatory system, it actually was masculinized. This bird um, exhibited behavior like a male. It sang, I should say zebra finch, and zebra finches, the males sing, the females do not. It copulated with a female, it fought with other males. Um, it turned out it was infertile. Uh, but what this study showed is that both genes and hormones are important. Before this study, a lot of people thought, well, some people thought hormones are most important. Some people thought genes are most important. This study showed that both are really important. Okay. Are there sex differences in behavior? Because I showed you that behavior at the bottom. Um, are there gender or are they gender differences in behavior? You know, in other words, are some of these effects in behavior diff associated with sex or due to gender differences, which would be societal or cultural? And how can we tell the difference? Okay, so if you have kids or if you go to the playground or the park or something like this, you, you can see some, um, some differences in behavior between boys and girls, okay? Typically in boys, you see more rough and tumble play. In girls, you often see more caring and nurturing play, okay? This isn't, isn't unusual. Okay, but are these, are these due to gender differences or sex differences? Okay, first of all, I wanna point out, and I'm using a very generic picture here, right, of Barbie versus a GI Joe is that there are some sex differences, but there's a huge individual difference, a huge influence of individual variation or differences. Okay, so for instance, if these are two bell curves showing on average, for instance, uh, females here and males here, right? There could be the average sex difference here, but if you compared two boys, right, Jose and John, you might see that their differences are actually not very big. If you compared two girls, Alice and Mariko, they could have much bigger differences, okay? So the point here is that there could be sex differences, but they can be actually much, they can be either larger or smaller than individual variations, a huge amount of individual variation here. So how do you get at the difference between sex and gender? Well, one thing is actually studies of other primates. So. It turns out that male monkeys tend to exhibit more rough and tumble play than females. Conversely, females tend to do more nurturing and caring play. So here's an example um, from some of the primate centers where you see females doing things like playing with the doll. Um, this male monkey has the truck gene. So he's playing with, uh, he's playing with the toy truck, okay? So you do, see some influences, some sex differences in behavior. So there are certainly cultural differences, so there are gender differences in behavior, but there are underlying sex differences as well. Okay, I wanna finish up by asking um, a really important question that people are getting at. Right now, it's, it's all over the news. Um, it's happening in high schools and it's gonna be happening this summer in the Olympics. And it's who gets to compete as a female. Okay, again, it's happening in high schools now. 
Does it happen in college? Yes. And what about the Olympics? And does it matter? Okay, there are people that say, just let everyone just have an open competition. Um, so first of all, let's talk about if there are sex differences in performance. If you look at a number of different sports, okay, this is everything, this is running, kayaking, swimming, cycling, rowing, skating, all these things. And you look at the difference between um, males and females, you see on average about a 10% difference in performance. That is male performance tends to be about 10% greater than female performance. And that's across all these different sports. And I've seen other analyses that give you about that same number. And again, it's across all these different sports, if you, especially like when you include things like swimming and running, running 30 different events, swimming 24 different events, okay? You still see roughly the same pattern where male performance is roughly 10% greater. And so one thing to, to take into account then is that if we just had one set of events, um, it would put females at a disadvantage. Let's talk about two common exam or popular examples that we hear a lot about in the news. And that's by, I don't know how to pronounce their names properly, but I'll do my best. Duti Chand from India and Castor Semenya from South Africa, okay? Both of them have competed in the Olympics. Um, Castor Semenya is actually the Olympic champion in 800 meters, okay? Chand has run, and I'm gonna ask you to actually remember this, these numbers, or I'll remind you of these numbers in a minute. She's run 100 meters in about 11.62, okay? Castor Semenya has done an 800 in about 155. So maybe if some of you have run track at some point in your life and those numbers hopefully mean something to you. If you haven't run track, that's okay. Both of these athletes have been accused of not being quote unquote female. They've also as a consequence been subjected to gender testing. Okay, again, I'm putting gender in quotes here because that's what it's been reported, not sex testing, nothing gender testing. Now, I will say that traditionally in the Olympics, what they did, you know, if you go back a hundred years is it was, uh, it was morphology, right? It basically was drop your trousers and that's how they would determine um, whether or not you competed as a male or a female. They've subsequently done things like chromosomal testing. Um, and now the big one they're doing is measuring hormone, circulating hormone levels, okay? Now I wanna point out to you, hopefully you've gathered from the previous parts of this talk, that each of these testing methods has major potential drawbacks, right? Just because you have a Y chromosome doesn't mean you have a functional SRY gene. Just because you have high circulating levels of testosterone does not mean you express androgen receptors. Okay, I'm gonna, now let's go back and put these two numbers in, relation, because I've heard people say, it's been in the news, people say, well, these two should just compete with males. Blacksburg High School, um, I got, because I'm in Blacksburg, I could get a hold of their track records. Okay, so the men's record in the 100 meters is by Cole Beck, 1037. Uh, Kenneth Hagen ran a 151.800. For the women's records, the 100 meters was Alan Carr, I guess that's how you pronounce her name, 1206, and Hannah Brown run the 800 and 209, okay? What I wanna point out to you, now I don't know the two women, both Cole, Cole actually is currently running track here at Virginia Tech. Uh, Kenneth Hagen ran track at UVA, okay? So both of them were quite accomplished. Uh, actually, I think Hannah Brown might have run at UVA as well. In any case, let's go back and look at these numbers. If, you were to, if we were to say that these two athletes should just compete with males, they wouldn't even set the records at Blacksburg High School, okay? Even though, especially in the case of Semenya, we're talking about, actually, I think she's now two-time Olympic defending champion in her event, okay? So the response that people have said that she should compete with males is not realistic. 
My guess um, is that both, and this is a guess, this is based on some news reports and whatnot that I found that are, I think are probably accurate. Um, these are obviously, a, there's privacy issues, so you can't see the actual medical reports. Both probably have partial or complete androgen insensitivity. So genetically, they could present as male, they could have Y chromosomes, they could have internal testes, um, uh, but not having male levels of testosterone activity. Notice I put activity there, right? Because that means that they're gonna have, that they would have uh, receptors, okay? So it turns out that at least, so the Semenya case has received more press recently because actually no, that's not true. Uh, the Chand case as well, both of them have levels of testosterone that have been deemed to be within the male uh, realm. Um, I can talk about my problems with that another time, okay? But they've been told that both of them have been banned from competition, including the Olympics this summer, unless they undergo drug therapy to lower their testosterone levels, okay? So neither one of these athletes is allowed to compete in the Olympics to represent their country unless they undergo drug therapy, quote unquote therapy, right? To lower their testosterone levels. And I wanna point out here that if they don't have receptors, which they may or may not have, then lowering their testosterone levels will may or may not have any effect on their performance, okay? So this is a problem where the people that are making these decisions aren't thinking a lot and don't have a grasp of the science involved. Okay, this was the basics of basis of the whole talk I gave you, right? Chromosomal sex, gonadal sex, determining hormonal sex, morphological sex, and ultimately gender. And I hope that this talk has given you a little bit better idea um, of how complicated sex determination is, how complicated gender is to define, and that anybody who says that it's easy or it's just male or female or just um, masculine or feminine is, is not being, uh, uh, doesn't understand the science behind it. And with that, I'd be happy to answer or hopefully answer any questions that you have. A uh, very interesting talk by Dr. Moore. Uh, any question? Let me try to stop my share okay. so I can actually see some people. All right. So if you have any question, you can just unmute yourself and then ask the question directly to Dr. Moore. So while the other people, while waiting for the other people to uh, have the question. Um, so uh, my question is, what, what do you think we should do with, uh, oh, with the testing for the athletes? Just to add another level of testing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is the big question. So here's the interesting thing. So first, I'm going to start by saying, I don't know. It's really complicated. When I give a version of this lecture um, in my class. It's actually a series of lectures. I divide it up and we go into some discussions and such. I start off by doing a survey of the students and I ask them who thinks they know who gets to compete as a female in the Olympics. And this is actually a lot of fun to do because first of all, often I have athletes in the class. And so I can ask them, for instance, you know, if Actually, last time I talked to the class, there's a woman that was on the track team and I asked her, did they ever ask you, are you a male or a female? And she actually said, said no. So anyways, I do this survey in the class and the ants, it, it, the, before we do these lectures and 80 to 90% say that they know the answer. By the end of class, Nobody has a good, well, very few have a very, have a good answer. They don't know. And that's my point is that it's very complicated. It's difficult. And I don't have a single answer. Um, this latest 
issue, which is where they just measure your hormone levels, I have big problems with that. Because first of all, we have no idea if these people have receptors. So you could have all the testosterone in the world, but if you don't have a receptor, it doesn't matter. The second thing is that when you're talking about um, testosterone levels, if we look at um, the medical records of average people, just going to your doctor, measure, you know, as part of a measurement to take your testosterone levels, there's a huge range, tenfold difference within men on their levels. And yet these are all men that present as quote unquote normal men and report no problems. Okay. So these are people that are really, um, so the, so the point is that levels are very variable with amongst individuals um, and there's no good reason for it and there's no big consequence. So they're all normal. Um, so I have another, that's another problem. Um, so that's a, yeah. So basically measuring hormone levels is not the answer. Uh, and so the take home messages, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's certainly more complicated than what um, many people in the field of um, sports I realize. Yeah. In trauma science. Hey, is there a viable test for the receptors yet? I mean, that's easily done in a research lab, but what about a viable human test? Yeah, exactly. So the problem is you have to have tissue samples. So we, I've actually measured hormone receptors. So a lot of the stuff I do is looking at hormones and behavior. And we've looked at receptor densities, but that takes requires taking tissue samples. And obviously, I don't think many people, well, when we do it with birds, we look in, in receptors in their brain. Well, <laughs> we're not going to do that in humans, obviously. Um, but even if you wanted to do it in muscle tissue, you'd have to take biopsies and stuff like that. And now you're talking about really invasive, you know, um, invasive things. And even if you have tissue samples, is there any way to know if the receptors are working properly? And that leads to my other question is whenever you said about the, the, the mutation that's making receptors not work right, are they still expressing and then not, not working right? Or they just aren't there? I'm sure that there's both types of, of mutations. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, you could do all these tests I mean, yeah, there are research labs that do these, but it'd be very involved. Um, and so it would really require, yeah, it'd require a lot of work um, to do that. And finally, let me bring up one last point about this. And this is what really the final thing that annoyed me about the testosterone thing is they said that these people um, didn't have quote unquote normal levels of testosterone for a female. Let's be honest here. These are Olympic champions, well, Olympians or even Olympic champions. There's nothing about them that's normal. They are at the top 1% of 1%, right? If you, for those of you that have done any sport, if you've played tennis, go try to return a serve from, Yo, from you know, Roger Federer. If you've played golf, go try to play golf with Tiger Woods, right? If, you've, if you're a sprinter, go try to sprint next to Usain Bolt. If you are in the Olympics, you are at such a higher level than the average person that comparing, you know, the, the comparing some measure of them and saying, well, they're not normal. Well, yeah, you're right. They're not normal. They're better. <laughs> they're just a lot better. So Nick, I have yeah. just a, a quick comment. I really enjoy the, the, the talk, uh, Dr. Moore. This is very uh, an eye opener. I think if even those people making decision were sitting and just listening, I think they could be they could make uh, you know better choices. But my comment to me on uh, are those uh, are the, I think it's uh, I look at it and I see a little bit of, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, discrimination or, you know, something close to that. Because when I look at uh, all those other athletes who have performed very well, they have always come to try and study. For example, Michael Phelps. They studied here, but they say that there's something, there's something to do with his biology. I think they say that uh, the length of uh, his arms and, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And the way he takes in oxygen and all that, that is, you know, like you said very well, uh, we say maybe not, not typical for an average person like me, me and you, but 
nobody who has said, oh, let's not allow people with a uh, wingspan of X centimeters, you know, or uh, uh, somebody like a boat, who's in boat. The same thing, they say that, uh, you know, he has some, I would say some, uh, some kind of advantage, the way he, uh, the body is able to deal with the, uh, uh, you know, oxygen levels and the, you know, but it's what it is. That's why, you know, people will compete and not everybody. I know there's an aspect of genetics and environment whereby you give same people the same environment. There may be some small genetic difference, but there's also an aspect of uh, same genetic, different environment. And it's very difficult to draw a line. So my thing is that uh, if someone is not doing this uh, uh, malicious thing, or they are not actually taking those, those, uh, the, the, those chemicals, they are not taking those hormones, uh, if it's just the body that it has the capacity of uh, you know, creating that uh, hormone, testosterone and all that, and it's not anything they are choosing to do, then I feel like uh, they should not be punished. If that's what is given, I I agree with mm -hmm. I agree with you yeah. 100. This is not. That's what I wanted. I should have emphasized this in the talk. They we're not talking about cheating. We're not mm -hmm. talking about doping. We're not talking about genetic manipulation. We're talking about people that are and it's and in these cases, these are people that they're not. It's not transgender, right? They are competing is what they were raised at and present as and consider themselves. And so this right. is very, and it actually it gets in Castor Semenya's case, it gets even uglier because she is from a, a, a relatively uneducated background. And these problems started when she was still a junior, when she was, I think, 16 or 17 years old. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine somebody, look, this is what I tell my class, how many of you were comfortable with your sexuality and your identity when you're, you know, a mid teenager, 15, 16 years old? Nobody is. Everybody has problems. So can you imagine what would happen if somebody in authority came and told you, we don't think you are who you think you are. And we want to test you and do all these things. And she's a junior at this point. She's a, she's not even an adult. Right. So there's, that's a whole nother issue, you know, issue involved here. But yeah, I think it's really important to remember that these are people um, that are not cheating, right? They are, they are who they are. And in, the, in your example um, with the swimmers is really important, right? Yeah, we don't outlaw them for having their arms too long. <laughs> right, right, right. So no, great points, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Youssef had uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Youssef, you want to ask your question uh, directly to Dr. Moore? Dr. Youssef, are you still there? I, I just want uh, some elaboration on uh, the Klinefelter syndrome and uh, that of uh, the condition of the hermaphrodite where both the nose uh, sexual organs are present in a single person. Yeah, so I can't remember which Kleinfeld is in. Is that the XXY? I think it is, is Kleinfelters. Um, so in that case, because they have a Y chromosome, they tend to develop predominantly as a male, but they do have two X chromosomes. And so um, I think they have a high incidence of infertility, if I remember right. Um, and then, yeah, you do have some cases, and typically in, in humans, we don't see a lot of, of true hermaphrodites, um, but you do have these, in, what we tend to refer to as intersexes, right? Where, for instance, the morphological sex doesn't align with the gametic, with, with the gonadal sex, right? And those are cases, for instance, if you don't have the androgen receptor, right? So gonadally, you see a testis, usually it's internal, it didn't descend into the scrotum, but they present as a female because they don't have um, the androgen receptor. So we consider them to be intersex. All right, any question from students particularly? Anything you want, Husk? Anyone have any question? 
Okay, if no further question, now it's 102. I think it's the perfect time to stop here, all right? Let's thank one more time to have to Dr. Moore for a very interesting talk. You can join me. Thank you. I thank him for that. Thank and you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. A wonderful, um, very interesting talk. Uh, I probably should have invited you to come to one of my classes to give a better talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll be more than happy to travel next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, hopefully the, um, the pandemic will be um, over very time, sometime soon. For sure. Um, and also thank everybody for being here today. Uh, again, this concludes our uh, STEAM H seminar series this whole semester. Uh, overall, I think we have a wonderful um, series um, this semester, and uh, not to mention uh, ending with such a good, uh, very interesting talk. Um, so this uh, talk will be also be available on YouTube. Uh, you can check out uh, the other recording on YouTube as well. Uh, with that, I hope everybody have a very um, smooth finish of the semester and enjoy a good summer. Great. All right, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Moore. Doc, doc, thank you, Dr. Shi. <clears throat> oh, I, yeah, we should thank Dr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mercy. All right. Uh, Dr. Mercy, if you want to stay a little bit. Okay.